Thank you. Well, uh, so how do I advance it? Do I go back there and bring it back? How do I? So we have. Um, okay. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Alrighty. Well, hi everyone. It's nice to see you. I know I'm not um, Dr. Ludensky. It's I think it showed on your schedule. We were flipped here. Um, I think so. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to share with you guys. Um, and so they asked me to share about adolescent mental health promotion. And so um, I thought I would do that. Um, I was going to have a um, a little. I don't know if any of you know about poll everywhere. I was going to do a little poll everywhere where we do these fun little word clouds, but. I'll skip that given our time. But my point here was just to ask you guys, um, when you think about adolescence, what word comes to mind? Do you guys just want to shout out like a word that comes to mind? It's always interesting for when I do this as part of my classes that I teach. Moody. Moody. Yep. Anything else? Huh? What was that? Puberty. What was it? A puberty. puberty. Yes. Mm, fun. Puberty. <laughs> Yep. Anything else? Making stupid decisions. Absolutely, making those stupid decisions. I can tell you as a mom of five currently having adolescents, they range in age from 12 to 22, and we'll talk about that long range of um, adolescents that I kind of have them on the, you know, from one end to the other, and they are definitely moody. They definitely have been going through puberty and their body is just changing all kinds of ways which makes their brain change in all kinds of ways and their mood changes in all kinds of ways. And so um, I think it's a daunting task at times but certainly a wonderful <coughs> task. And um, so we'll get a little bit into that in terms of their mood and what can we do and how can we support adolescents during this, um, this period in their development. And so I'm going to do um, just a quick overview of what I've hoped to accomplish in this time with you guys. So I'll talk very quickly about some important milestones and um, then talk about sort of what are the mental health um, issues that are faced by adolescents and children and then looking at some of the barriers to mental health access and then some current interventions and what can we do. And um, Feel free to interrupt me at any time. I hope to make this more engaging as opposed to a lecture because that's no fun to be lectured to. So feel free to interrupt me at any time. Um, so I think of adolescence, you know, you can think, oh no, adolescence is upon us. But I really want to change this as more, you know, it's a wonderful window of opportunity, right? When I was in graduate school, I started I'm a developmental psychologist by training and so I like to look at things through a developmental lens. And um, when I was growing up and in graduate school, it was really looking at those first three years of life as that magic window where we can really, um, you know, have an impact and looking at brain development and what we can do. And you know, I was, um, you know, playing baby Mozart, you know, to or playing Mozart to my baby while I was pregnant, you know, in my tummy and all of that. But really, adolescence is another window of opportunity for us to have such a positive impact in our our youth and and have, um, you know, you can go down one path. But it also, it doesn't mean just because you're on one path that that's where you're destined to go, right? So um, I'll never forget one time we were in our, my car um, with my mom and she, um, my husband and her were talking about where we were going and she was like, you can't get there from here. And he was like, what do you mean? Just because we're going in the wrong direction doesn't mean we can't get there, you know, like we can always get there, you know, it's not like there won't be another road that can take us there. And so kind of with that mindset of thinking, we may be down one path, we may have some moods, we may have some moodiness, we may be going some, through some crazy changes, but we can have an impact. Um, I love looking at this um, cartoon. At your age, Tommy, a boy's body goes through changes where, um, that we don't always, are not always easy to understand. And as we probably all know, youth, in terms of their development, um, it's not always in unison, right? So they, you know, I'm gargantuan, I grow a bunch of gargantuan boys, um, and so they look older than they are. And um, people will think that, try to treat them older than they are, but they're pretty dang immature boys, I can tell you that from lots of experience with my boys. Um, and so they do, people want to treat them as being older, 
females we know they mature much young, you know earlier than boys do a couple years on average and so their bodies may be maturing they may be getting advancements from older guys um, and how do they handle that how do they know how to negotiate those relationships and interact and so we'll talk about that a little bit too and um, and you know for me I think you know this is a perfect example like what who are you like what's going on around you and what's coming out of you I don't really understand what's going on um, and so we have to kind of break those apart certainly is a complicated um, time you know we have to pay attention to all those pieces you know you think of it that like the pies the physical the intellectual emotional the social right so the all pieces of their puzzle really help with the child's um, emotional use, emotional development, um, how they're um, doing. Um, and you can ask somebody at one moment how they're doing and they can be doing okay, but by sometimes just the virtue of asking somebody how they're doing, it can really kind of bring, bring up and conjure a lot of thoughts that they may not necessarily have thought were going on for them. Um, so just very quickly, quickly and briefly, thinking about some of these important milestones, right? So as infants, um, you are, um, you know, wanting to resonate with sounds and voices that you hear. You, you know, you think of that contingent responsiveness. The baby reaches out and you respond. Um, hearing your voice, learning how to talk, um, but that emotional, your uh, emotional development happening um, very early on. And I was going to show you, but I don't think we'll have time. But um, you know, one of the studies that we've done is looking at sleep labs, right? So you think that you, one of the big studies I'm involved with is it's called the child um, um, child neglect uh, centers for child neglect, and it's a, it's a number of our s sites. And we were looking at a sleep lab, right? So mom and baby come in, and it was with teen moms, adolescent mothers, and bringing their babies in and observing them. How do they put their babies to sleep? What do they do, and how do they interact? And in the um, video, you see the mom, it's a 16 year old mom who, um, you know, their circadian rhythms are very different, right? So they like to go to bed about 2 a.m. and get up at like noonish. Um, babies, right, six month olds don't follow that same cycle. They like to go to bed more, you know, nine ish and getting up at more six ish, right? So there's like this huge six hour window of difference um, in terms of their sleep patterns. And um, it shows this video of, it's just a 45 second clip, but you see the mom had, um, the baby had woken up, brings the baby, get in the bed with her, and, um, and the baby is, through the 14, 45 seconds, is, oops, is constantly reaching out for the mom, reaching and reaching, and um, the mom is, you know, just conked out. It's eight o'clock in the morning, she's conked out. And um, eventually, you don't hear any sound, you don't hear any cooing, you don't hear any crying, you don't hear any kind of verbalizations at all. And um, after a number of times, the, the, the baby's finger just kind of latches onto her hair. And so she just, you know, really, you see her push away and lean to the other side. And everybody's always like, oh. But, I mean, I'll ask, what do you see? What do you notice? And things that you notice are that the baby's not crying. The baby's not, you know, having any vocalizations. And the baby's... Um, is not getting that nurturing from that very early age of any kind of um, contact so that the baby's already learned by six months of age. If I cry, nothing happens. If I, um, you know, make a sound, nothing happens. If I reach out, well, yeah, I may get rejected, right? So, one, the language not being developed, and second, their emotional development's not being um, fostered as well. And so, you can see if you have these um, patterns over time, you know, over and over, it's going to affect your, your brain development as well. So you're not getting those neural connections that are happening. And so um, it's a very, you know, early on, this social and emotional development, of course, is happening. Um, you know, as you start to get those um, and during uh, childhood, um, you know, and I think of middle childhood is another wonderful period you know you think of middle school years does everybody did everybody love going to middle school was that like your best time ever going to middle school not necessarily right that's when you know of course we get the huge spike in bullies and we get the you know we're going to the different classes and we're having to take our books but you know you usually get these merging of elementary schools to this bigger you know middle school and everybody's you know going from 
uh, am I normal to am I attractive, right? Do, what do people think about me? Um, and so their whole um, cognitive development is changing and then emotionally, right? Onset of puberty, how do you deal with this? All, um, but you want to start becoming more like friends. You want to start engaging in those, um, you know, dialogues with your friends. You want to be like them. You want to dress like them. You don't want to be, you know, an outcast. You want to be invited to the parties, you know, or going to the movies, or whatever. Um, but it's showing much more independence um, necessarily from play dates that you've been having earlier on. Two, when you are, you know, really getting to adolescence, and this is. At some point, you hope you're establishing, you know, going from I am, am I normal to am I attractive to I am who I am. I don't know if I've reached that yet, but, you know, that's the kind of goal to get to, to be who you need to be and having this sort of increased independence and sense of emotional and uh, maturity. Um, so adolescent development, you know, it is, um, adolescence is um, having your mental well-being is a normal part of development. Um, and it's typical for adolescents to feel anxious, right? A healthy level of anxiousness is good. Um, and it can be a barometer for, you know, should I go out to this party? Should I get in a, you know, am I going to be prepared enough for my class presentation? Am I going to want to get in that car with somebody who's drinking, you know? So it is, can be, your anxiousness, anxiousness can be healthy and, you know, being a barometer. But, um, it, it, when it becomes a mental health disorder is, you know, when it's these persistent feelings that are affecting the young per person and how they're feeling and thinking and how they see the world and what they do in terms of their actions. Um, and if it interferes with their daily activities, right? So if it's, I'm so anxious that I could, you know, like if I came here and I was prepared, which probably could have been more prepared for today, but prepared for my presentation, but you know, I start breaking out in hives, I start sweating, and I, my hands start shaking, and I just can't get up here, right? Um, that's not necessarily a, a normal level of anxiousness, right? And so um, if it affects how I go to sleep at night, if I'm able to um, you know, unwind from the day, and you know, I may be thinking, okay, I need to do these things tomorrow, I need to you know, put down on my planner that I've gotta get prepared for, um, you know, a presentation I'm doing afterwards, or I have this test for tomorrow, or I have a big game. But if it becomes so that I can't go to sleep because I'm so worried about how I'm going to play in my game tomorrow, or whether or not this guy or girl is going to go out with me, um, that's when it becomes debilitating. And, um, you know, it comes in many forms. You may not sleep, you may not eat, you may overeat, you may sleep too much. And so it's, it's looking out for some of these um, warning signs that we see, right? So if you see some physical symptoms, like we just talked about, if you see those mood changes, right? So are you typically somebody who's happy-go-lucky and you all of a sudden start changing um, and you, know, you don't want to engage in conversations with people or you don't want to go out and, um, to the normal places that you normally would? Um, if you start, you know, start um, saying that you don't, you don't want to play your normal sports anymore, um, and having some intense feelings, right? So um, having those to where you're, it's, it becomes debilitating for you. Um, and again, it's a lot of these changes that you see. So some people may be typically quiet, some may be typically very talkative, some may be typically a certain weight, but if you see fluctuations in, those, in, in someone's weight or you see fluctuations in how they interact, these are things to be looking out for. So who's all affected? Um, so we know that one in five adolescents in the U.S. will um, experience a serious mental health condition during their lifetime. But only 28% of youth with severe major depressive disorder will receive consistent treatment, right? So that's a pretty huge number. And building on that, we know that one in eight, um, that depression is the most common mental health disorder affecting nearly one in eight adult adolescents um, in any given year. And about, yes? Um, so when you say consistent treatment, what do you refer to? Well, it can be a range, and we'll talk about that too, right? So there's a, a number, a, a range of um, uh, treatments um, that can be. So it could be going and seeing a counselor. So if you're a student at the university, or if, you know, if you're in school, going and seeing a consistent counselor. 
If you need psycho, um, you know, if you need medication, being able to receive consistent treatment. Um, when we look at um, like ADHD um, is another, of course, we know about form of um, mental health concern. Um, you know, some receive um, treatment uh, in terms of going to see someone, some go and have medication, some receive both, but it's the waxing and waning too. Um, and what we do know is that if you don't get treatment um, for it, it, you know, a, sort of an episodic um, you know, condition will become chronic if not if left untreated, and so that's where we really have the concerns about this too. Is if you if you're not treated, then it, it becomes less sort of these episodic issues and becomes much more chronic. Does that help? Um, so about half of these will happen before the age of 14, um, and so it's. Um, I'll show a few clips in a second, but many. You know, many of us think, oh, you're too young. Like, what do you have to be worried about, right? You've got food on, on your plate. You've got clothes you can wear. You've, you know, you go to school. You've got things going on. How in the world could you be, you know, upset? What do you have to be upset about? But many do, right? Um, and as we know, um, kids at the age of, you know, around three, they start to know what it's like. They know what it means to be a girl or a boy, right? And they know that they start to have these feelings about what does it mean to be a boy or a girl, and then it starts to grow. And um, and again, you know, those um, lovely middle school years of when you're starting and you know, 10, 11, 12 years of age, and people are sometimes not so nice, right? We know the girls, they're the mean girls you can have, or you can have, I mean, I'm being very stereotypical here, but you can also have the, the guys, you know, if you're not big and buff and whatever, and physically active, um, how that can feel. And it, it starts early on, like we said, during puberty, and that can, um, it's, you know, the age of puberty, the onset is, um, is getting younger and younger. Um, and we'll talk about brain development too, and how that can affect it. Um, but it's the number one mental health and substance use disorders are leading cause of disability worldwide. We think about major um, depressive episodes. So this is when um, they feel depressed um, most of the day, nearly every day, and for at least two weeks in the past year. And you can actually just ask these simple kinds of questions um, very directly and, um, and find um, that here, this shows a um, major depressive episode for the past year for youth 12 to 17 years of age. And, um, and this is what it's looking like over the years. So it's certainly increasing. Um, so percent with major depressive episode um, is the one on the top, and then the other ones, it's kind of grayish, or with the severe impairment, so severely impairing um, what they can do. So as you can see, it's increasing over time. Why do you think it's increasing so much over time? Like, what has been happening in the world lately? Like, what do youth do? Hmm? Social media. Social media. I think it's just the worst thing ever. Social media, right? Our technology. I mean, how many of y'all have social? I mean, it's not my business, really. I won't ask that. How many of you guys know about other people who have social media, right? Um, um, and uh, how many of you guys know about kids who have social media? All right, we'll say college students. How many of y'all know? All right, what about high schoolers? What about middle schoolers? What about elementary schoolers? Yeah, what do you, I mean, you think a first grader knows what to post on social media? Or, you know, how they know how to navigate it? I mean, no. I don't even know, how, you know, I, I, trying to think about what we should or do and put on there is, it's daunting and scary and who doesn't like to like get a like? Who doesn't like to get a shout out or a follow, right? But being able to handle that, uh, it is so bad. I mean, that's all I got to say, it's just bad. And um, how we perceive of our bodies, how we perceive of, you know, I think everybody in here knows who Kim Kardashian is. Does anybody not know who Kim Kardashian is in here? Like, who doesn't want to be, you know, live in her lifestyle? She just shared her playground, or what's it called, her playroom, right, on social media because everybody was teasing her because her house was too minimalistic or whatever. Kids see that. That's what they, um, 
you know, did you not see that? <laughs> no. She showed this, I mean, her playroom was probably the size of this room, and it had, you know, a section for every kind of thing that you would want, um, or a child would want of her four children. Um, but w as we see, though, it's kind of, that's who they look up to and um, who they see. I'm going to show you a, a few examples of ways that we can use social media as a good thing. Um, and so there's always good, right? And, and I always try to say that in anything, that there is good in, in everything. Um, and so really with social media, we have to look at ways to use that to support youth and um, having you know, a, a healthy diet with social media and a healthy diet with engaging with their phones. Um, but youth today, when they start driving, they don't know how to stop at a stoplight without picking up their phone. I mean, I'm not gonna ask how many of you guys do that, but you know, how, seeing a youth pull up to a, a stop sign or pulling up to a, um, you know, a, a, um, a light, and the automatic thing to do is to reach over and look at the phone and see, you know, scroll through, you know, Instagram or look at their Snapchat because they just got something from somebody real quick, right? And um, our kids' brains are being so wired differently today and their ability to effectively multitask. I mean, they think that they're great at multitasking, right? Um, but their ability to truly effectively multitask um, is really being altered and their their brain development is being altered. Um, we know that um, as we talked about, you know, how it's changing over time and that, you know, kids as young as, um, you know, two to eight years of old having um, a mental health con uh, concern, you know, one in six, that's, that's a lot, right? So you think about an elementary school classroom and they're usually about 20 to 25 kids in a class. So if you have one out of six, you could have a handful of kids in that classroom who are facing, whether they're facing an anxiety disorder, ADHD, having behavior problems, having you know depression. And again, thank you for asking the question, right? If they're not treated, that can then become a chronic condition for them. And then you see that happening, you know, by the age of 14, about half of them already having something that's gonna be something that's life term. Um, what this shows you is just kind of looking out over time, depression, anxiety, and behavior disorders. And um, as you can, I mean, as you might imagine, they, they increase over time. Um, uh, you see here behavior disorders, as we talked about that lovely middle childhood period, the, you know, the six to 11 year olds, and that's where the behavioral problems kind of come out um, and um, uh, being more prevalent than the younger ones or the older ones. Um, ADHD here, um, as you can see, having diagnosed with ADHD. And this is what I was talking about in terms of those who are being treated or receiving both. Another thing that I just wanted to highlight and us think about um, certainly is uh, suicide. Um, and um, we like to uh, refer to it, not saying committed suicide, but died by suicide. Um, as we know, the word, words that we use can sting, but the words that we also kind of place on it, we want to um, pay particular attention to. And it used to be um, that it was the third leading cause um, of death among youth. Now it's the second leading cause of death among youth. And um, it's, um, you know, something that is very prevalent. Again, social media, um, and just, we do have a greater awareness about mental health and our goal is to reduce stigma around mental health in ways that we can talk about it. Um, so we are doing a lot to talk about it. Um, one of the, I'll talk about it in a minute, but one of the things that we're working on at UAB is um, a, a big group of students working on what we're calling mental health ambassadors and trying to address um, mental health concerns, particularly among college students. Um, and what's um, their transition to college, but also being in college and graduate school. Um, so we know it affects all youth, suicide affects all youth, but um, the rates are, are somewhat different. Um, we know that uh, females attempt it more, uh, suicide, and, and, but males have a higher percentage of completing. Um, anyone wanna share why you think that might be? Firearms, which are more fatal than trying to hang yourself or kill yourself with pills. 
Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, and we know that suicide rates are higher among L our LGBTQ youth. Um, and so, you know, really what we can do to reach out to our youth and working with them and, and supporting them. Um, and there's a lot of uh, trainings that we do. All of you are at UAB, right? Are all of, I know there's some faculty here and stuff, but and this is mostly students, maternal and child health, or nutrition students, is that right? So, um, it just made, so there are a lot of trainings on campus at UAB. Have any of you done QPR, question, persuade, refer? How many of you have done that by chance? Yeah. Um, well, that would be a great thing to have this next training if we do it, but question, persuade, refer um, is, it's, it's called gatekeeper training, but it's a way to, basically you, you work up to asking the question if the person is um, considering um, suicide and um, you know, there's sort of a wonderful um, kind of way that they uh, share to build up to asking the question, but recognizing if someone um, is, you know, as we talked about having some of these, um, you know, very um, significant mood changes, are they really withdrawing, are they sharing, you know, starting to give away their things, um, or are they starting to sort of saying their final kind of goodbyes, but not saying this is my final goodbye, but just making sure that they, um, you know, really poignantly share how much they love someone. Um, if they um, yeah start giving their things away, but do they um, are they just you know so sad that they can't you know leave their room? Do, are they starting to seclude themselves? Are they starting to um, not be with their uh, friends at all? Are they changing their their you know patterns? And so you want to start off by saying like I've noticed this, right? So building up to it, I've noticed that you're not coming you know to the games anymore. You know, I know we used to love to go watch the games together. I've noticed you not wanting to come to the games with us. Um, I, I'm wondering, wondering is a really great word. Like I'm wondering are, how you're feeling right now. Um, you know, have you been thinking about suicide? It often feels really hard to do. Um, and it will role play a lot when we do the, these trainings. And um, you know we're writing down how we would say it, but once we say you know get up and role play it, it's it's a much different thing. But and people think one of the myths is people think that if I ask, then um, I'll put that in their mind to do it. And you know it, what showed what they show is that that's not the case. Um, and another part to that is um, you know I had a hard time with this at first, but saying. Um, can you promise me that you will not do anything until we get you, you know, get you to safety? To me, that was saying, okay, well then is it gonna be okay for them to do something once they get to safety? But it's really trying to, people who are contemplating suicide, they think more in the moment. They're not thinking about tomorrow. They're not thinking about, you know, what's gonna happen later. But getting them to commit to, for now, can you promise me until, that you will not do this? Right, so kind of building up to it, saying I've noticed this, um, and I'm not doing a full training right now, but I'm just kind of trying to put that out there of things to be thinking about, and with youth and things that what we see, um, and so that we can um, really build up to wrap our arms around our youth. Yeah. I was just saying, um, when you ask why men um, commit suicide more than females, men are very pressured Mm -hmm. also if they are um, attracted to the same sex they are scared to come out so that's another reason yep yeah and, and we see that so yes both of those things um, certainly happen and there's lots of um, you know stigma associated too with depression right men aren't supposed to be sad they're not they're supposed to you know um, be able to handle it there's cultural things too in some of our communities that you know we're supposed to be strong women we you know we're not supposed to you know bow down to to any of um, you know concerns that we may have so yes <laughs> there is that stigma that's associated with it and um, how we handle it um, you know I was just um, you know reading about you know Dwayne Wade right and him um, sharing about his daughter um, and you see 
um, him getting blasted from like these two rappers that just, I mean, I, okay, I'm not always on social media, but I do try to stay up on top of things. Um, but, you know, him getting blasted by two rappers that are pretty well known, you know, just recently because he came out on the Ellen show, right, and talked about his 12 year old daughter who's trans female. And, um, and accepting her for who she is and you know him saying that when he was in the NBA right he was in the locker room saying all these crazy things too about people um, but now trying to embrace his daughter and trying to embrace who she is but at the same time now he's you know getting this flack right but he's a strong person thankfully and you know and he's being able to handle it but for many who don't have that um, you know, either the money or the resources or the just intel, you know, their own um, sense of self that they're able to handle that. Yes, right. Anybody else have any thoughts they want to share? Feel free to interrupt me. Um, so yeah, let's see. All right. So um, I'm just going to grab my phone because I'm not good at looking at time. Oh my gosh, it's 11:12 already. I wanted to show y'all some videos too. Ah! All right, so I'll get going. Um, and y'all can have these slides too. I don't know if there's going to be something where you share these, Emily, or not. But um, I'll try to bust through these now, realizing that I got so few. Um, but so young children can benefit from an early from early um, evaluation treatment. So here are some of those things that I was just talking about, right? So I think what we recognize from children versus adolescents, they kind of manifest or they come out as different things here. Um, so yeah, not interested in playing with the same children or struggling academically, sleeping too much, um, maybe just not being able to sit still. This is for older adolescents. Again, having losing pleasure in the things that they usually um, have pleasure in, um, feeling down, um, just, you know, of course, starting to engage in some of those risky behaviors. So, you know, eating, drinking, smoking, um, all of those kinds of things. Um, either having highly elevated energy or just sleeping way too much. Um, and some things I wanted to talk to you about, kind of bust through this, you probably all have had exposure to adolescence and their brain development and kind of puberty and all of that. But they're especially prone to, you know, mental health concerns because of all the changes that are going on in their body, you know. Um, and they're starting to assume more responsibilities and, and having to take that on. But like, how do they figure out how to take on those new responsibilities and the tasks that they have? Um, and people around them may be doing more risk-taking behaviors. So they may be conflicted about it, they may want to do it, they may not, and then feel badly if they're not doing it, right? So there's all that kind of going on. And just trying to learn emotional regulation. Um, this point here is also thinking about just, um, you know, as we alluded to the Mean Girls earlier, but, um, you know, popularity is a big thing for youth, right? They want to be popular. They want to be cool. And what we do find, too, is that some of the most popular kids will do anything to stay being the most popular kids, right? So, you know, I'm being very stereotypical, but if you think of, like, the cheerleader who wants to stay the head cheerleader, right, she's going to make sure she is. And, you know, that's what we do see, though, right? We do see some of those patterns of behavior. I'm not if anybody was a cheerleader in here, I'm sorry. I was a basketball player, quite obviously. But, you know, um, so please, no offense for that. But what we do see is that many popular teens will continue to try to be that popular person and will do what it takes to get that. So we have to look at that as well. And, you know, the affiliates, you know, those that are around them wanting to stay part of that nice network of the cool kids or, you know, what they'll do to stay being part of that cool group. Um, so, you know, you have to look at that, too, and, and who they're hanging out with. Um, we do see that mental health has a lot of um, things associated with it, right? So a lot of health conditions, um, again, um, anxiety, um, and chronic illnesses. Here's my nice transition to talking about the brain. Um, <laughs> thinking with the left side of the brain or thinking with what's left of the brain. Um, so are they a brain from the start? And here I'll just make the points that, you know, um, 
during adolescence, you know, your, our brain goes from back forward, you know, your prefrontal cortex. And then I always try to tell my husband that they just can't think, right? They literally just can't think. It's their prefrontal cortex is not growing, right? So they don't think about saying stupid stuff. They don't think about, you know, how to make that decision of, um, you know, what used to excite them of going to McDonald's isn't really so exciting at the age of 18 anymore or 15, right? Um, them being able to get in the car and think it's really cool to press on the brake and go, you know, from zero to 60 is really fascinating. And that's what, you know, charges them up, right? So um, what gets them charged gets to be, you know, even more risk taking as well. Um, but we do know that, you know, those as we I was talking about with that young baby, right? If you're not using those connections, they get pruned away too. And so we, we want to foster those prune, um, connections that help them, you know, set priorities and make good decisions and um, have good um, thoughts. Um, here's just talking about the hormonal things. Um, but in here, I was just talking about sort of that reward deficiency syndrome and of, um, wanting to be rewarded best. So, Barriers to accessing treatment. Um, certainly we've talked a little bit about st stigma, right? Not wanting to go out and be that guy that went and got treatment or sought treatment, um, you know. Um, having insurance coverage or not having good insurance coverage. Um, and then just the availability of mental health services, where they are, how they can access it. Um, there's a lot of um, misconceptions I uh, alluded to this earlier, right? They're just being dramatic. I don't know if any of you have seen these um, about you. They're just being dramatic. They're overreacting. I can say I've said that before to my kids. Like, you're just totally overreacting. <laughs> yeah. Really? That's bothering you? Or, um, you know, they'll grow out of it. Like, just let them, just let them grow out of it. Um, they're too young, nothing stressful, traumatic in their life to have caused it, right? So you have not gone through a death in your family. You have not, you know, um, you know, both your parents are together, right? There's no alcoholism in our family. Like, nothing's traumatic happened in our family, so why are you, you would not, you, there's no way you could be depressed, right? Misconceptions, of course, is what I'm saying. Don't quote me to that, and that would be the clip that's showed. Um, or that it's their parents' fault, or their school's fault, right? It's somebody else's fault. Um, so we wanna look at ways to promote mental health, right? Um, and there's a number of ways. I wanted to share, you, share with you some of these um, ones that um, I think are some pretty cool ones that are out there, but you can do it from the individual level. I'm sure we've all seen the social ecological model. Um, and looking at various levels um, from the individual, the family, the community. Family, happy moments like these are treasured. Mm -hmm. Just last year, their daughter Hannah was in a much different place. Because of a medical condition, she has fainting spells, and kids at school were making fun of her. I didn't realize that the police had gotten so out of hand until the spring. You know, she just sort of kept it all to herself because she, she finally told me she didn't want to be a burden. Hannah had anxiety and fell into a deep depression. And then one night, Hannah's mom, Robin, had a feeling something was wrong and snuck up to Hannah's room. I look at her, and she has a handful of my husband's blood pressure pills, and she's putting them in her mouth. It was at that lowest moment in my life where I just wished that I had um, a button that I could press to immediately alert my friends and even my family members that, hey, I'm not okay. That dark moment led to a bright idea. Hannah enlisted her younger brother, Charlie, to design an app. I just felt completely helpless during this entire situation. The siblings invented the app Not OK, a digital panic button. Hannah shows us how it works. When someone is feeling not OK, they can press a button, and the app sends a text message to up to five pre-selected close contacts, along with her current GPS location. There is a comfort level with social media, with mobile devices. So putting a resource for getting in touch with people that you care about and that care about you in that space, I think could help a lot for with a lot of different conditions. Hannah is on the mend. Hey guys, Hannah here, and welcome to the fifth day of Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. She and her brother now create inspirational videos on mental health, encouraging other young people that it's okay to be not okay. They even got a shout out from Beyonce's sister, Solange Knowles. That was honestly the coolest thing in the world for me. And while she still deals with fainting spells and depression, 
Hannah says creating the app has given her darkest moment a different meaning. The beauty for my ashes, because all last year was just so much pain, and now it's like I'm living my dream. It's so cool. <laughs> Imagine how many people might need that. If you'd like to check out yeah, Hannah's... Can you hear me? So I just thought that was a, um, a wonderful example of some, a, a youth who, you know, she had contemplated suicide, and thankfully her mom was there and found her, and thankfully she has a brother who's, who's a tech guru and can help her create this app, but that she is doing um, something, you know, positive with it. And I... Um, and I think that there are lots of examples of that. And there's another one I could show you, but I won't um, put you through that again. But, you know, there's this and one. It. it may work now. Oh, it does? But you want to try. Uh, well, okay. Um, Well, this one's about my younger self, um, and this one um, talks about, um, it, it's a bunch of celebrities, you know, and they talk about their younger self and what they went through, and this is another way how social media can, um, yeah. It's okay. It's okay. Um, I, can, I only have a couple minutes, too, and, I don't, and Harriet's been so wonderful to switch to go this morning for Marissa, so I don't want to... Um, take up her time but um, there's one about my younger self right so there uh, celebrities are one way certainly who talk about and helping in the stigma or dress stigma and talk about um, you know how they would give uh, advice to their younger self and hopefully others can listen to that this one is about an Indiana school who's created a, pro a program to help change youth so wanted to give you a variety of examples, right? So within schools, things that we can do um, at UAB. We are currently, as I mentioned, um, I started a program called um, uh, Mental Health Ambassadors Program. And so all students are, um, we're now launching that. And um, we have a new Instagram account. I'm trying to use it for good. So it's um, at UAB MHA. Mental, stands for Mental Health, UAB Mental Health Ambassadors. So go follow us. Um, UAB MHA and um, we're going to be sending out uh, self-care Sunday so what talking about things to do for self-care on Sundays Mondays motivation mindful motivation Monday and that's basically um, about you know just mental health awareness and then Thursdays resiliency um, for upperclassmen and graduate students and then Fridays for transitioning um, to school for freshmen and so four times a week we'll be you know putting out messages about mental health and mental health awareness um, and we'll be doing stuff on campus but really just peer-to-peer um, -peer education is another way to really get peers um, so many youth so many college students are facing a lot of anxiety or facing a lot of issues and so what we can do as peers to help each other and so working on that so I think I'm at 11.30 now, so I'll stop. If anybody has any questions, or I have plenty else I could say for sure. Well, thank you, and I'm sorry for all the trouble.